Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Lisa, who's come to preach this morning. How many of us will remember 18 months ago when Lisa last preached? Oh, a few, a few, a few. Yeah, Lisa was here 18 months ago and curiously spoke on the book of Daniel. <laughs> Eight, prophetic, yeah, yeah. So 18 months ago, um, Lisa came and actually spoke on Daniel chapter one. So it's wonderful to have you back. Uh, speaking in the second part of our Daniel series. It was the introductory talk last week, which I gave and introduced our theme of hopefulness in exile. And uh, Lisa has the pleasure of working with Glenn. <laughs> she has the pleasure of working with Glenn. Let's try that again. Somebody has to. <laughs> um, on, the, on the national team for the Baptist Union of Scotland. And you've 30 years experience in church leadership. Now, Lisa was the minister. <laughs> You're getting heckled here. <laughs> um, Lisa was the minister at Skipton Baptist for 20, more, Seven. 27 years. 27 years, Lisa was uh, leading Skipton Baptist Church. So we're delighted to welcome her this morning. And I'm just going to pray before you. you speak. Who is it? Yeah, Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak this morning. We give you that invitation in our own hearts and lives to listen. We quieten ourselves to listen, Holy Spirit. And we pray that uh, through the word of God and through the words that Lisa will speak, Holy Spirit, will you breathe? And will you bring us an assurance of hope this morning? And will you speak to us in the places where we need to hear your voice? You know, you know what those places are, Spirit of God. And will you speak into them this morning? We, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Belle, and it's um it's lovely to be here again. Um, uh, to keep the football stories going, it feels a little bit more like a home game than an away game. I feel like I've been here a few times now, which is great. Um, and uh, I love what uh, I, I love what you're doing with the second half of of Daniel. Um, I, I wasn't so kind to my church. We did the whole thing, <laughs> um, but just picking up some themes that run through these last few chapters, which is a much wiser way of doing it, really. Um, so I'm going to just read to you um, a bit of the passage from Daniel chapter 7 to put my little bit in context. Um, I know that Belle spoke about some of this last week as well. So Daniel chapter 7 and uh, from verse 9 just gives a little bit of sense to what we're going to talk about together. So um, Daniel says, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the, boat, the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. That's interesting. Oh, it slides. There we go. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this is the, uh, the key focus for us uh, this morning, these couple of verses here that talk about one like a son of man. How many of you like reading fiction 
books. Yeah, good. Well, um, I'm reading uh, the Seven Sisters books, which is really good because there's loads of them. You don't have to decide which is the next one to read. So I'm really enjoying reading those at the moment. I've just started book three. Um, it's good to read them when they've all come out because then you don't have to wait for a year till the next one is written like, you know, we used to have to do with Harry Potter. So I'm really enjoying reading those. How many of you have seen Top Gun Maverick? Oh, not enough, Glenn. You need to put it on in the church, I feel. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is about like Gideon at the water, isn't it? Um, uh, maybe some of you saw Top Gun, the original. Yeah, right. Well, we have this film club at the Village Hall where Mike and I live, and uh, it, the last film was Top Gun Maverick. It was rammed. <laughs> it was super popular. Obviously, just all about the storyline. Um, th this is uh, <laughs> this is a these are a set of books, and this is a film where. The story of the past makes sense of the present reality. That's the key thing. Lots of the books, that fiction books, lots of the films that we watch, they start in one era and then they flip back. And it may be a decade, it may be centuries, whatever, before. And then all of that stuff makes sense of the present reality of what you're talking about. So whether it's those Seven Sisters books or whether it's... Uh, it's Tom Cruise uh, in Maverick. It's only the past that really makes sense of the present. And so really that's kind of what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna start with the present. Oh, I haven't got enough uh, things to put anything on. <laughs> we're gonna start with the story of Jesus. We're gonna start with the story of Jesus. We're gonna do what most of these books and films do, which is we're gonna start with the present the story of Jesus. And then hopefully, we're going to make good sense of what he says from the Daniel text so that we understand the present in the light of the past. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't now, it should do in just a moment. I'm kind of hoping that all of you have a, a birth certificate somewhere, because otherwise, slightly worrying if you don't have one. Um, on that birth certificate, it has your birth certificate name. Now, my birth certificate name is Lisa Stephanie Rush, because that was my name when I was born. That's on my birth certificate. And then there's, you know, what people call you. Um, and uh, so they may call you in school by your proper name. Well, my proper name is Lisa, so that's not a problem. But I'm married to Mike, but he was called Michael when he was at school because that's what other people called him at school. And then there's the bit which is what you would like or choose to be called. Now, Belle is not Belle's whole long name. So the first time I ever got an email from her, I was like, who is this person? And I was like, oh, it's Belle. Because Belle is what Belle likes to be called. At least I assume that's what you like to be called what you choose to be called. So we're actually quite complex when it comes to our name and how we define ourselves and how other people define us. So arguably Jesus on his birth certificate, let's just conjecture a moment here, was called Jesus Ben Joseph, Jesus son of Joseph. I mean, that's a logical thing that he might have had on his birth certificate had there been one there. Other people around him at that time called him Jesus, Rabbi, Christ, Lord, Master, all of those different terms in the same way they might call you Mrs. something or Mr. something or Dr. something or whatever. You know, there's all sorts of ways that we are identified by other people. But the name that Jesus chooses most often to call himself is Son of Man. So I want you to kind of register that for a moment, that Jesus mostly chooses to call himself son of man. And I think what we choose to call ourselves is perhaps the most important thing of all, because we know why we've chosen that. So we're going to look together at how he uses that name. Um, so here we go. First of all, now this is the story of uh, the paralyzed man being let down through the roof. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says, after he says to the man, your sins are forgiven, 
take up your mat and walk. He says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. So note, notice that. Here we have him feeding the 4,000, healing the blind man. Jesus de uh, Peter declares Jesus as the Messiah. So it's all a really high point of the story, very exciting. And it says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So here we have Jesus, named Messiah by Peter, not saying to Peter, oh, thank you for noticing. Now we'll carry on. The Messiah is going to have to He says, the Son of Man is going to have to suffer and die and then be, uh, rise again. Thirdly, that actually should be the high priest. But that was the picture I got. Uh, in Mark 14, he's arrested. This is Jesus before the high priest. And Jesus says to him, I am. I am. Who do you say you are? I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Does that sound familiar to you? Good. And the high priest says, we need to kill him. He has spoken blasphemy. Now, he didn't say in that statement, I am the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. He calls himself the son of man. But the high priest immediately understands what Jesus is talking about. You see, it's as if, it's sliding, is it? Uh, Archie, I might need you to do that for me, I think. Let's try again. No, there we go. Right. It's as if he's giving them the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. He's just dropping all these pieces down and saying, can you work this out? Can you work out the picture here. Can you put all the pieces of the puzzle together here? Here's another slide for you. I don't know why it's not working. I don't know if I've got it off or on. I can't quite decide. Ah, there we go. Um, can you make sure it's on? Yeah. Thank you. Here we go. And I've just put these down here because I, it wasn't until I started looking them up that I noticed how many times Jesus does this. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Matthew 20, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 24, at that time, the Son of Man the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the, of the sky with power and great glory. Oh yes, we recognize that one again, don't we? But you know, it's not just in the synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, thank you, Glenn, but also in John. And sometimes we notice differences between those first three and John. But even in John's gospel, the same thing Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. And then John 12, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then chapter 13, when he had gone out, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's really important, this term. And I really genuinely don't think I'd noticed how many times it appears. And it grows in intensity. And the depth of the claim is more and more evident as you go through the story of each of the individual gospels. I wonder if you have an experience of uh, collective consciousness. You see, um, we've lived in Yorkshire for a really long time, and there is a collective consciousness about those who live in Yorkshire compared and in opposition to those who live in Lancashire. And you can read those uh, little adverts there for yourself. Um, I thought I'd stay in the safe zone and talk about Yorkshire and Lancashire this morning. <laughs> 
There was not a single day that passed when someone didn't speak disparagingly about Lancashire living in Yorkshire. If you were going across the border, someone would say, make sure you've got your passport and all that kind of stuff. It is in the collective consciousness of those who live both in Yorkshire and Lancashire. It's in the collective consciousness because of the Battle of Bosworth Field, which is the conclusive battle of the Wars of the Roses that occurred in 1485. 1485, and we're still having the conversation about whether you should go to Lancashire from Yorkshire or not. You shouldn't. 1485. You see, that's what collective consciousness is, isn't it? Let me tell you another example of it. I did uh, my master's degree at London University in a college called Haythrop College. And part of Haythrop College was as a Jesuit training institute. That wasn't really the bit I was in. You, you'll realize that. Um, and one of the early lectures that I was in, and I had two Baptist colleagues who were with me, huge lecture theater. The guy at the front used the word windows. And there was this ripple around the whole lecture theatre, apart from the three Baptists, who looked at each other in a, we've missed something here. We have no idea what's going on. When I think about windows, I think about those things. And if I'm not thinking about those things, I'm probably thinking about the thing that's on my computer. But actually, you know what they were talking about was Vatican II. Um, I didn't have an in-depth knowledge of Vatican II at that point. I still don't really. But October the 11th, 2022, it was 60 years since the start of Vatican II. It was the biggest church event in the 20th century. All of the bishops of the Catholic Church, that's 2,625 of them, with the Pope and special guests and observers met together from 1962 to 1965. That's quite a long conference, isn't it? Um, John the 23rd convoked a council, are you ready, to open the doors and windows of the church to usher in a new springtime of renewing the church and presenting the faith in a relevant way. If you were a Catholic, the word windows was logged in your collective consciousness. And when someone mentioned it, everyone went, ooh, I was not part of that. I didn't understand. I couldn't get it. It is still a groundbreaking experience. Here's another question. How many of you have ever pitched a stone into a pond or a river? and just watched as all the ripples bounced out. You know, the rabbis had a similar kind of approach to their teaching. It was called, uh, I can't remember writing, remez or a hint. And uh, they'd take this scripture passage and they'd, they'd drop it in. And they just assume that the audience knowledge would allow them to work together and work out the fuller meaning that's the kind of thing that Jesus did. He took a little verse or a little term and he dropped it in the middle of them and said, just watch. Watch as the ripples come out from amongst you. Watch and see what is going on there. And that's exactly what he was doing with this term, son of man. Son of man. Every time Jesus said son of man, it was like he dropped a pebble in the pond and the ripples worked out. So let's just spend a few moments understanding that together. I you wonder what I've been talking about. So just a little brief word on Jewish education. First of all, they went to primary school. Primary school was called Bet Sefer. And in primary school, they learned the Torah by heart. Okay? Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, the other way around. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They learned it off by heart. That was primary school. Then, after that, you went to Bet Midrash, and you learned all of the rest of what we know as the Old Testament and all the interpretations off by heart. And then if you were specially clever, you became one of the Talmudim, which is you became an apprentice to the rabbi. Okay, 
log that in your mind for a moment. So when Jesus says, son of man, there's a whole bunch of people there that have learned all this off by heart. They know it inside of themselves in a deep and deep way. So son of man, let's start at the beginning. We could be talking about just human beings there, the sons and daughters of men. In fact, C.S. Lewis picks up that terminology, doesn't he? Human beings, human beings starting with Adam and Eve were called upon to rule over the animals, the creatures. They were made in the image of God. But instead, what happened was that one of the beasts came along, a slithery one, and challenged them, challenged their understanding of God. And instead of ruling over the animals, they let the beasts rule over them. But even in that moment, there is the promise of God, Genesis 3, verse 15, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's the first little bit there. And then we move on. Go out, tree, you do it. Then we move on to the story of Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Cain and Abel. Cain is very jealous and angry with his brother for the, the fact that God accepted one of the sacrifices and not the other. And God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. And you can choose whether to master it. You can choose. Are you going to rule over it or is it going to rule over you? And well, we know the story, don't we? Cain allowed sin to come into his life and to master him. And he murdered um, Abel. And there's continued division and bloodshed as instead of bearing the image of God and ruling over the land, it's the other way around. And so that the people of God, sorry, the people grow and grow and grow. They want to set themselves up against God and they create a tower, the Tower of Babel or Babylon, same place. So where do we find Daniel? In that very same city in that very same city, in exile, in that place where people set themselves up against God and wanted to say, we're God, we can rule. We are going to let this beast nature rule in us. And you remember all the visions that you're looking at right now for the next couple of weeks? It's all the beasts, the beasts who are symbols of the kingdoms of those that set themselves up against God. And in the story of Daniel, we see this glimpse into heaven, just like in Revelation. It's like we see a glimpse into a different reality that is going on at the same time as our reality. The beast, who are um, the symbol of death and destruction, who, the rise of kingdoms, ever increasingly violent. Kings that are arrogant and full of pride and empires, we see all that through Daniel's eyes, and we see the throne room of heaven. And it says there, there were thrones set up. On one sat the Ancient of Days, but one was left. And that's what we see, isn't it, in this wonderful passage, that the Son of Man rides on the clouds up to heaven, and he sits on that empty throne. And all human kings, all of humanity, worships and serves him. It's an amazing vision. It really is a vision of hope. So when we hear Jesus say, son of man, when we go back through those scriptures that we read before and many others as well, every time we hear him say, son of man, we should also hear this amazing vision of revelation, the echoes of scripture, especially Daniel chapter 7. Jesus knows exactly why he's calling himself son of man. He knows exactly what he's doing as he casts the pebble into the water. He knows exactly the conclusions that all those around him will come to every time they hear him say that, the son of man thrones were set up the ancient of days sits upon the throne and he gives the kingdom to the son of man 
to Jesus and to the servants of God. Jesus, the perfect human, the one who faced every challenge, every temptation, and on every occasion he mastered sin and lived a perfect and obedient life. This is Daniel's expectation of a messianic kingdom that is to come. And perhaps the most shocking thing about this is that Jesus' enemies recognized who he was before his friends. The devil recognized who Jesus was. His enemies recognized who he was. Jesus was nailed to a cross for blasphemy because they knew that what he was saying was, Son of man, Son of God, the one to whom the kingdom will be given who will overcome every kingdom that sets itself up against the name of Jesus but he overcame not with power not with arrogance not with might not with armies not with tyranny not with dictatorship but by serving and laying down his life on a cross he is the complete antithesis to everything that we see that sets itself up as powerful. And that's the Jesus that we follow. That's the Jesus that we want to be like. That's the Jesus that Bill is being like in the football field, stadium, back room, serving, being present, loving, listening. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Two more things briefly, I promise. See, the week before last, it was the Ascension. And we're not very good at celebrating Ascension, primarily because it's on a Thursday. I think if it was on a Sunday, it would be easier. I have no concept as to why it's on a Thursday, by the way. Anyway, uh, there's probably some reason. (laughs) But, you know, the Ascension is this very moment in Daniel chapter 7, isn't it? This is the moment where his followers saw him going up in the clouds, the same clouds Daniel speaks about. And being given the throne, that ascension is really, really important. Really important because it's the final bit. You know, there's the, the living, dying, being in the tomb, being raised to life. But without the ascension, it's not the end of the story. That's when he's given the kingdom. He sits down. Sitting down is a sign of authority and completion. He sits down. And in that moment, he is given all authority. In that moment, there is awe, because awe is like the perfect kind of worship when there's nothing else to say. That moment is the antidote to sin and death and hell. Because as Belle was talking about last week, it's out of that that there's victory over all these kingdoms of the earth. And out of that comes Pentecost. Because as Jesus sits on the throne, he gives his Holy Spirit into the world to empower us to live that same Jesus life where we are. So here we go, last slide. 26 centuries ago, Daniel saw this vision. That's quite long ago, isn't it? Six centuries later, Jesus told the Sanhedrin that they would see the Son of Man at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. After this has happened in Acts 7, Stephen, as he is dying, says, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13, John says, And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And my friends, I think that above everything else, this gives us a steady vision of hope throughout the ages. That Hitler's and Stalin's and Putin's and Pol Pot's can come and they can go. And this is the story of these visions of Daniel and Revelation. But there is one like a son of man who is constant, who is constant and who will overcome, who has overcome. We have just yet to see it all brought to completion, yet. But the victory is certain through Jesus, one like a son of man. Amen.